Okay, so thank you, uh, thank you very much for, uh, for tuning in again from the virtual jug and from Night Hacking. Um, this is going to be a really fun session. This is uh, with me today. We have uh, Martin and Thomas. Yes. And uh, tell us a little bit about yourselves. Where are you from? What are you, what are you doing? Yeah, so um, I studied computer sciences in Munich and afterwards I joined TNG Technology Consulting. Nowadays uh, we are doing a lot with gesture control. That's also where we got our uh, in contact with Intel. So now we are Intel software innovators. We are also Intel black belts, and uh, we have our non-commercial blog, uh, ParrotsOnJava.com, where we post videos about all our activities. Okay. Yeah. Right. So my ma um, my name is uh, Martin Furch. I studied computer sciences as well. Um, I'm working for TNG Technology Consulting since 10 years and uh, yeah, in, my free, in my free time I'm nearly doing the same. So we have this blog, parrotsonjava.com and the same for me, Intel Software Innovator, Intel Black Belt Developer. And you forgot to say that we are Java Run Rockstars. I was going yeah, <laughs> to you know. mention that actually, it's great <laughs> yeah. to have Rockstars. Actually yeah. I'm a Rockstar as well myself, so we've got a good panel of Rockstars. Yeah, there congratulations. <laughs> Okay, yeah, uh, and uh, in our 10% uh, of our uh, work time, we are allowed, uh, allowed to yeah, work on projects we like to do. So it's not our bre uh, bread and butter job. Uh, so, and then we are doing uh, crazy things. For example, we build a panorama camera, for example, um, with which you can uh, photograph a, a, a 360 degree, multiply uh, 360 degree picture with one shot. Okay. Yeah. And uh, what else we did? Yeah. Um, then we have this uh, augmented rift, which uh, you can see here. And we will show it later on in more detail. And uh, this is an augmented reality device with which you can see the, the eyes and uh, the world through the eyes of a Terminator. Right. Yeah. And also, we have more demos and more videos, so I think we should start. It's yeah. going to be a fun session, so uh, <laughs> let me drop on to, uh, let's drop on to this one. Yeah. There we go. We can see the slides now, so, uh, so yeah. yeah, let's go for it. Okay, uh, t so the title of the session, uh, Terminator meets Minority Report, Augmented Reality and Gesture Control with 3D Cameras. So this is what uh, Thomas and me are doing uh, in this 10% of our uh, working time and in our free time. And so, as Intel innovators and so on, we have uh, access to very early prototypes of 3D cameras. So, something like this here, yeah, it's, it's a 3D camera and it can nearly do the same like a Kinect somehow, but only weights 50 grams. But uh, let's continue. Yeah, or do so you so have a question? So, describe to us what a 3D camera is then. So, um, this is a R200. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, yeah, it's... Um, there are infrared uh, uh, lasers implemented and infrared cameras, and it uh, sends out um, coded light. Or do you want to continue? Or it's a coded, a coded light, and uh, the surface will reflect uh, the coded light, and then the infrared cameras are able to to generate a depth map. Okay. <laughs> depth map. <laughs> okay. Um, so maybe we'll start with the history of yeah, sure. how Let's all this started. Let's go for it. Let's go for it. So, yeah, that's it. Since I So, um, yeah, if you if you like uh, uh, to follow us, uh, yeah, there are our, our Twitter um, uh, names. So Martin Furch and Original One Ninety Eighty Four. So, welcome and uh, follow us. And now let's start. Yeah. So, um, speaking about gesture control. Um, this is the uh, WDR um, Wissenschaftsshow means uh, so it's a comp uh, it's a science show with uh, Ranga Yogeshwar in 1990 and uh, here you can see a smart uh, software consultant and um, <laughs> explaining how gesture control works. So you can see he's uh, using a normal home video camera system and uh, with a, I, I think it's an indie workstation. I'm, I'm not sure, but I think it's an indie workstation, a very old computer. And uh, you can see that Ranga Yogeshwar is able uh, to push the ball on the screen. You can see, so the, the video camera is recording the hand and he's able to, to move the ball around. Yeah? In, this was in 1990. You can tell from the, uh, from the clothing. Yeah, 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 yeah. definitely. <laughs> definitely. <laughs> definitely. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on. 
Yeah. So this is one of the first webcams uh, which were actually able to record a video stream. So this was from the year 1995 where Siemens built a system based on the Silicon Graphics Indie Cam, which you can see. On, which you could see on top of the screen and it was used uh, so if I move my head around uh, the skeleton in the background also moves its head around and for the year 1995 it was quite revolutionary but it was a very simple technique back then uh, so it used just uh, simple algorithms to detect the, the head so you could easily distract it with some other object which almost looked like a head, like a hand, for example. And, and at that point, it was quite—it was—it's pretty simple, right? It's just yeah. a single object moving. There's no yeah. interactional yes. bending of, yeah. of limbs or anything like that. Yes, it's yes. Yeah. Okay. And it's based. Uh, and it's based on uh, 2D image processing. So there is—it's not no a 3D camera, or, you yeah. know. Yeah. Okay, so uh, now we make a huge step in history. Uh, now it's 2008, and uh, yeah, it's Omlo Oblong Industries G Speak, and now this looks somehow like Minority Report. So you can see a, a, this smart software consultant there, and he can move videos around. Uh, he can control uh, uh, the the apps there. You can see, and he can scale images, and he can paint ugly pictures on the screen, for example. And this really looks like Minority Report, but uh, if you have a nearer look, uh, he's wearing some gloves. Yeah? And uh, it would be cooler if uh, you can do such things with, without attachments on your body, you know? So, and this is uh, how it comes right now to some 3D cameras, mm. where, you, where it's not necessary to, to wear something special. Yeah, uh, in the year 2012, uh, actually the first promotional video got out on the 1st of April, where we thought this must be an April's Fool because it was so precise. And then one year later we had the camera, and uh, if you have a look at it, so this is the device, so which I hold in my hands right now. It's a really small peripheral, which you can just attach to a normal USB 3 port, and then uh, it can track the hands, so it is uh, specialized on the hands, but it has a, a really crazy um, um, precise it is re accuracy. It's accuracy. Yeah. So it yeah. is precise like hell. Uh, it is uh, precise to up to 0 0.01 millimeters for right. each of the fingers, and there we also have a visualizer for that. Okay. So Martin will put his hand on top. You can see his hand right now. But um, you see here, the movement move? of the fingers. Can we move ah, this any okay. just so the camera can get it, maybe? Yeah. So you can see Martin's hand and the well, fingers once, on once the once screen do exactly the same. And this is, by the way, an HTML5 visualizer using nothing but CSS 3D trans uh, transformations. I, uh, I only just put it on screen, so it just looked like you were uh, being a bit crazy, putting your hand over that contraption, <laughs> but now, now people can see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, there was, there's, uh, there was a really good session I saw with a guy called Herz Bevin from, uh, from Belgium. He's, he's a musician, uh, and, uh, and he's, he's done a lot of work with kind of uh, digital music from Eigen Harps and, and uh, Lindstruments and things like that. And he, he produced, actually, can I have a go? This is cool. He, pr he produced, um, effectively, it's just, a, it's just a bunch of digital, uh, analog signals or digital signals that you transform into music. And he produced something um, whereby you can actually change, change musical yeah. pitches and things just by, just by moving your hands across this. And it was, it was really, really in interesting. Yeah. He was also at the Java One, I think. He was, yeah. He did a, he did a session yeah. at Java One, uh, which included this as well. Um, I've used the Leap Motion, and uh, yeah. with Java, I've implemented a, a Leap Motion based synthesizer, so you were able uh, to control the synthesizer just with your plain hand. Yeah. And uh, I was able to, to use the cut off filters and stuff, and, and I was able to, to, to pitch the synthesizer. Uh, signals and uh, I, w I was able to modulate them and so on and so on. It's really crazy. It makes much fun. So I have a music band as well, and uh, I've played with this live on stage. And the people were, "Wow, what, what? That's crazy. Yeah. That's cool." Yeah. So do you see? Do you, do you see this as the next step for Minority Port, where you have something which which is tracking your movements uh, like underneath, or is this just a, a, a closer step to that? 
it's not the closest step to it and there are also other cameras uh, and Leap Motion is moving into the direction of putting their device on an Oculus Rift and then uh, streaming it into the virtual reality at the moment. So this is where it's heading and uh, there are uh, other cameras with which you can see uh, the world uh, as w which are in front of you with which you can for example track your head or um, the hands in another position. So we'll get to this, this in a m moment. Okay. Quick question in from IRC from Liz. Um, how much is the Leap Motion? Um, the Leap Motion now, because uh, it's from 2012, 2013, and it was uh, uh, market ready, uh, I would say now the price is about 50 to 60 dollars, I would say. So it's really, really I would say it's affordable. Affordable, yeah. 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 And uh, there are loads of APIs that you can hook into as well and do right. Yeah, do yeah definitely. You, um, you can use it on uh, uh, each and every uh, um, operating system. So Linux, Windows, uh, Mac OS, it's not a problem. And uh, what I really like uh, are the SDKs for, for example, for Java. They are really good. They are really good uh, uh, to handle with. Um, uh, we were able to control a quadrocopter, a, a parrot AR drone with gestures with the leap motion in one hour. Wow. Yeah. Um, so we let people fly around with it and this was the most intuitive um, control we had and some were even able to land the quadrocopter on a table within five minutes. So, so virtually no latency as well, really responsive. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. Okay, cool. Well, sure. Yeah, so this is a video of the drone battle we yeah. thought with, uh, with the leap motion, so this is somehow uh, related to the game. Um, yeah, it's uh, one must fall is uh, the gaming style here and uh, you can see uh, in a few seconds there are no rules, you know, fight and now the drones are starting. And uh, now have a look, um, uh, we have uh, different uh, camera angles and uh, you can see uh, uh, um, in the picture there are different videos here, video streams, and you can see how our hands are moving around there. And um, we, we, we control the drone and the idea is uh, to, to push uh, uh, the drone of my opponent and then it should fall down, so I, I get a point, yeah, you know. So, and uh, if you have a nearer look onto the hands, and how the drone is responding, you see it's responsive. Yeah. Yeah. And it makes so much fun. So who won? <laughs> <laughs> I think Martin That's won. Martin yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he is the better pilot. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. And another thing you can do uh, with, um, for example, um, this is um, the game Parrot Attacks or as it was called then, pa uh, Parrots on Target. So we did a small video where we, uh, there was a game in Germany which went viral, it was called Moorhuhn. It also came out in the US but there, or in the UK, as Crazy Chicken, but there it was not that uh, it was not recognized that much. So you had to shoot down with the mouse, you had to shoot down some birds and you got points and uh, back in 2000 everybody was playing it. Okay. And uh, <laughs> 15 years later <laughs> we thought we have to do this with gesture control. So yeah. here I'm trying to get the bird out, out of the tree and I fail so Martin shows me how to do this correctly with a gesture camera. Right. In, in this case, the real sense F200. Yeah. So um, the game Parrot Attacks uh, is written completely in uh, HTML5, so there is no WebGL and Flash uh, or whatever used. And it was implemented with, uh, in this case, with CoffeeScript, mm -hmm. uh, because those uh, gesture cameras are able to to send the data over a WebSocket, so you can access them really easy mm -hmm. and uh, now you can see the game these are the birds by the way I, I draw them I'm not a really good uh, artist <laughs> so um, uh, I, I hope you can see that these are somehow birds <laughs> and uh, now you can see that I'm doing a, 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 um, yeah, how to say a shoot, shoot gesture so and uh, 
if I don't have any uh, uh, any more ammo, I just can reload with such a gesture. We've implemented this with Leap Motion and with the two uh, F200 from Intel RealSense, and um, now we want to show in this video how the gesture recognition works. So when I'm doing my hand like this, okay, at first hold your hand like a pistol, and uh, you can see. But the hand base is the green point and the, the blue point is the trigger finger and uh, I can move my finger around and the idea is when I'm doing a, a, a shooting gesture, something like this, I have to be really fast and those, this hand base point, the, the green point and the blue point, they will come together, you know? And the speed, we calculate the speed and if there is a, a, a speed, a defined speed, if you reached it, then you will have a shoot. Yeah, and the most difficult part here is distinguishing between a reload and a shot because yeah, yeah. Um, they pretty much look the same. So you have to uh, also uh, track the speed of the hand itself and not only of the extremities. Do you, do you deal with the depth as well? I mean, like with a reload, you'd expect them to yeah, kind yeah, of be similar kind of depth. We'll right? take the. First, um, with the first extremity in the set direction yeah. and the one in the y direction, yeah. and we'll track the movement of the y direction extremity. So I, I tried this yesterday at your booth, <laughs> actually, yeah. and it was surprisingly easy once you once you actually understood exactly what you needed yeah. to do, and it's it's fairly intuitive. Like when you when you do it a few times, you realize you know what works, what doesn't. It's a, it was actually really really it started really really being very very usable. You know, it's yeah. not like yeah. you, get, you get used to it within 10, 20 seconds and you're like, oh, okay, now I know how to do this. It's very <laughs> But intuitive. it's still not that easy. It is still a challenge. It's a so. challenge. It should be a challenge. Yeah, because. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Okay. okay. Um. Yeah, and then in 2014 we got the Kinect. So this is the Kinect version. Two, uh, it's also called Kinect One if it is for the Xbox One. Uh -huh. And this uh, was a huge step forward back then because it had, had a VGA depth resolution and it also used time of flight instead of uh, the stereo pattern which we saw with the earlier cameras. So it sends out photons, it, it recognizes uh, how long they fly uh, back to the uh, back to the Kinect itself and then it can tell what the depth of uh, each and every pixel is. And is, it, is this really Intel under the covers or is this... Uh, In this case... In, uh, no, th this is just Microsoft. This is just Microsoft, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I think uh, this is interesting as well. So uh, what is the, the range uh, it operates? Uh, Thomas, can you please? Yep. So the, uh, the leap motion, um, uh, the operation uh, range is uh, up to one meter. Mm -hmm. over the leap motion. This is okay, this is fine. Uh, the F200 from Intel RealSense, um, this is the early, early prototype here. You can see it here. This is the very early prototype and this has uh, uh, operation range uh, up to one meter as well, but it's front facing. The leap motion is from uh, downside to upside, so this is front facing. And the Kinect has up to, I would say, 4.5 meters. Is it, ri is it right? Yeah. yeah. That's right. Yeah. So here's a game I implemented. Uh, so this is a Chrome plugin, and I, I thought it would be a good idea to play Flappy Bird using the Kinect. And here you can see our visualizer. It is uh, moving the same way as I do. And I try to control the bird uh, with flapping my hands. And Ooh. here I, oh. I did two. two and that was your and top this, score, right? Uh, <laughs> this was the top score. Yeah. It, was cr uh, it was hard. It, it was really, really hard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And you, uh, um, and this is maybe, you can say this is a disadvantage uh, of gesture control. Uh, 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 if you play this a few minutes, you get somehow gorilla arms. Yeah. So uh, have a look into the Wikipedia article of uh, gesture control. There is an entry for gorilla arms. Yeah. Okay. And, so, and so why is it why is it so much harder with this? Is there a latency? Is there is there a certain, is there a bigger kind of time gap from when from when you know the gesture is recognized and it's not always at the same time? You can't accurately do it. What, what's the reason? So the main problem is um, not the latency of the camera itself, but the latency of the movement. So uh, it is only recognized when your arm is 
in this position. So you start, so you want to uh, do a, a flap or you want to go upwards with the, your bird and then you start and then it is about 100 milliseconds until your arms reach the point where the, uh, the, the, the movement is activated. And it was even hard to do this with a normal keyboard where yeah. you have actually no latency yeah. at all. Yeah, and so it's because we're analog, essentially. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. so this was the biggest problem to yeah. get used to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, questions so far? Uh, no, we're good. We're okay. We're good. Yeah, here we are doing another demo with the Kinect. So this is uh, controlling a Tumio, so a small robot using uh, the Kinect uh, and using a, a control metaphor which is called uh, body joystick. So the, 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 Tumio, uh, the Tumio 2, uh, it's the small white robot there. Um, the Lego stuff, um, it's our own. Um, what we are doing here is uh, the Kinect is uh, running on Microsoft Windows in this case and uh, so we've implemented um, a program which gathers the skeleton data and then uh, we transformed it into a JSON object yeah, or JSON data and uh, this gets transferred via Wi-Fi to, to a Raspberry Pi and this uh, Raspberry Pi translates the JSON Kinect data uh, into uh, a control signals for the Tumio. So okay. the Tumio 2 normally uh, is uh, you can implement with Azeba. I, I think it's um, uh, its its own programming language for the Tumio, and uh, yeah, this is how we realized it. Yeah. So how, how many gestures here did you? Uh, did okay, you so uh, there is uh, the circle gesture just to uh, uh, to start or to end. Mm -hmm. Um, the gesture movement and uh, we have two gesture metaphors so one is uh, I'm, uh, I'm a joystick my whole body is a joystick so I move forward so and the robot moves forward I go back backward and the robot drives backwards so and to the right and to the left and then we had another uh, gesture metaphor where I'm using um, we call it hand reference so I take my fist I start, I start the, the, the robot and then I take the fist and I can move forward, backward, right, left and with a circle gesture I can stop everything again. So how many, how many gestures, like with something like this, presumably there's a, a limit of gestures before all of a sudden, you know, one gesture starts looking like another or, or is, uh, is there a chance you reach this limit or is, it, is there literally much more granularity in the, in the, in the coding? Yeah, you have to be very... Uh, distinguitive b between the gestures because um, it is hard to recognize more gestures which look pretty much the same so you will get false positives and um, so, so this is uh, not fun we had a we had problems at the Java one conference we were just hacking away uh, uh, so the voting machines and uh, doing it with this and that and uh, neutral for this and this was hard to distinguish because because um, it's pretty much the same if you do this or if you do this right yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, state of the art. So we already uh, mentioned the Intel RealSense F200 camera, and uh, so uh, this is we, which we are using in our hardware project. This uh, so in the Terminator vision, and uh, maybe a few words to the F200. So we already said uh, one up to one meter uh, operation range, um, and uh, it works with coded light technology. I, I think we already mentioned it. So. Um, um, yeah, that's it. Or yeah, it can do. So uh, the F200 is capable of doing a lot of things. So it can, for example, track your head. It can track your hands. It can detect up to 22 points on each hand, yeah. up to 78 points. And also the knuckles and oh, yeah. joints here. Uh, up to 78 points in the face. in the face, and it can do emotion detection. It can identify your faces, so it can remember you if you uh, leave the picture and go in again. Um, and it can also do speech recognition and speech synthesis. So there's a lot of stuff implemented in this camera, and you can expose it in a relatively easy way. But we'll get to that in a few minutes. You can tell when you're frustrated and angry at the software not understanding what you're trying to do yeah, yeah, by, right, by right. your facial expression. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, 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 one feature is that you can 
um, uh, I measure the heart rate as well. And um, this is done, uh, how, how does it work? So with each and every heartbeat, 15 grams of blood get pressed into the head and this results in a very, very small color change in the skin and the camera is able to detect a small color change so then you can measure the heart rate. Maybe it's not that precise like a medical device or something like this but uh, it, 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 it's quite okay, it's, it's fine. Okay, so now we want to speak about our Terminator vision. Yeah? Okay. Okay, so um, as we already told, um, we have those 10% of our working time at TNG Technology Consulting and uh, our dream was to have a wearable device with which we can see the world through the eyes of a Terminator. So uh, in the year 1984, uh, this was the very first footage material, the very first picture uh, uh, which was uh, uh, seen by the Terminator T-800 in the, in the first movie. And uh, you can see on the right side and uh, that there is, some, uh, there is some extra information in his field of view and uh, it, it's a crosshair where you can see some location based data. The same for the left side, there is a compass. Uh, with some directions on it and the very important thing is in the middle there is another crosshair and there you can see uh, he can focus on objects and can execute operations on it for example tell me uh, analyze or recognize <laughs> and um, from the point of view uh, 1991 uh, this is Arnold Schwarzenegger and uh, by the way, he's naked in this scene and he needs some clothes. So now he's and moving. Boots and a motorcycle. Yeah, 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 right, right. <laughs> so he just goes into the coral bar. And uh, this is a cool thing because now he is able to do real time measurement of the, the, the people walking by. And he's executing an, an operation, which is uh, the, the fit operation. And this is a really cool thing. So this is the rocker here, yeah? The rocker consultant. And uh, you can see. He's executing the fit operation and, um, oh, there is a match, yeah? And uh, you can, uh, on the right side of the screen, you can see fit probability 0 0.99. So, it fits, mm -hmm. you know, the, sorry, Thomas. And um, in the next scene, he says, give me your boots, your clothes, and your motorcycle, mm -hmm. or so was. It always sounds better with a German style accent as well, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> so we wanted to do the, basically the same, and so we thought about it. the first step would be to create this Terminator vision uh -huh. at first. And uh, this was done initially in our so-called winter retreat where we go into the Alps and then we try to do the everything in one day. So we took off-the-shelf hardware like the Oculus Rift, we, uh, we took the RealSense R200, two uh, normal RGB cameras, put them all together and uh, tried to do the software and build a system with which you could see the world through the eyes of a Terminator. And our core team was about uh, 10 people, then we, uh, we, we, we were actually able to create all of this in one day, the first prototype, and then we uh, did some refinement of that, yeah, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so uh, augmented reality means uh, that you uh, enrich uh, things you're seeing uh, with uh, computer-generated information. So this is the main idea. And uh, Ivan Sutherland was the very first guy uh, um, yeah, realizing an augmented reality device. It was called the Sword of Damocles. And uh, here you can see him, and I have some footage available. And you can see him uh, walking around or yeah, moving his head. And uh, it's a re it has a huge weight, the device, and it, it's attached to the ceilings of his laboratory. So uh, and now he's looking through his uh, displays and he's able to see a wireframe and as he's moving his uh, head around, the perspective of the wireframe changes as well, corresponding to the movement of the head. Mm -hmm. And uh, why is it only a wireframe? Yeah, this is because of the processor power, which was not that powerful like today. And this was the very first uh, augmented reality device. And um, the name, the Sword of Damocles, the reason for, for this is because it's just right over your head mm -hmm. and attached to the ceilings and yeah many hundred kilograms somehow 
Yeah, and the definition of augmented reality was uh, done in 1992 by Thomas P. Cordell and David Mussel. And they wrote a paper for Boeing, and it was about um, attaching, um, installing cables uh, within an airplane. So the idea was uh, uh, to help people uh, where to, to screw something, uh, where to install a cable. And the idea was to have a head-mounted display to, to, to enrich your sense your you know uh, with computer generated information saying okay here please screw here or install the cable like a like a, effectively there. Like a simulator so they when they're right. actually there doing it they're not right. effectively doing it for the first time kind of thing yeah yeah they also uh, the first name actually was artificial reality yeah. but this was already taken by a drug induced state so yeah uh, the, they changed the name okay <laughs> Yeah, here we have the HoloLens from 2015. It was actually after our prototype came out that Microsoft presented his first prototype and we were like, whoa, what have they done? And yeah, it is a head-mounted display. It doesn't need an extra computer. It has a 3D camera built in and it can augment the normal environment or at least a portion of the normal environment. And so uh, Thomas already said uh, only a portion uh, um, of your field of view is augmented. So I, I don't know the exact uh, um, maybe maybe 20 degrees uh, field of view uh, are augmented. So what does it mean? Let's say I'm having a look uh, to, to, to Thomas uh, using this app. You can see here in this animation uh, only a small portion of his face is actually um, augmented. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, but we have to be honest, it's the very first prototype and uh, we expect that they will improve this a lot in the next upcoming versions. And so what does it mean? So the guy here in the marketing video is definitely able to scale uh, this screen on the TV, but maybe he's not able to see the whole screen from this short distance. That's it. And uh, uh, um, in our augmented rift, because we are using the Oculus Rift here as a base, um, uh, we have a fully augmented field of view. Yeah. 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 So there's a lot of uh, glasses coming out within the next few months or years. And these are just a few prototypes which you can see here. They are, I think there are two t uh, types of different uh, glasses which you can buy. So the first one looks a lot like the Google Glass, so it just has a small display through which you can normally see a normal screen uh, on which something can be displayed. So this is a bit old school, I would say. It has been done by Google Glass before. And the, the second type, like uh, the Epson Moverio or um, another glass, which we will present right now, is taking advantage of um, semi-transparent displays, like the HoloLens. And uh, with them, you can see the, your normal field of view. And through the transparent displays, you can also augment the normal world. And this is done uh, at the best at the moment with the Affair Air. So this will come out uh, soon, um, I think this year. And it, is, it uses these semi-transparent displays and it is, has a field of view of 55 degrees. So it can um, pretty much augment most of your, field, uh, of your normal field of view. That's so cool. So, so actually uh, there are already development kits available. So. Uh, but they are not uh, uh, mass market ready, I would say. Yeah. Because, yeah, development kits. Sorry? Because, uh, that's also because they are pretty expensive, so at the moment they cost $4,000. Okay. Roundabout, yeah. So, okay. Um, do you want to learn something? Of course, always. Yeah, always. Okay, so let's talk about the taxonomy by Milgram. So, um, yeah, we are speaking about mixed reality, so there are different kinds of reality. Um, we have the real environment, the augmented reality, but there is an augmented virtuality existing as well. And last but not least, the complete virtual environment. Okay. And uh, yeah, we just point out some cool demos we want to show and uh, to, to, yeah, we want to identify 
is it real environment, augmented reality, what's the difference maybe somehow? Um, so let's start with a project from the, uh, was it East or South Carolina University? I'm just, uh, I mix it up right now. Um, let's say East Carolina University, or we ask the community. <laughs> what you can see here right now is um, we have a sandbox. And the projector, the projector is um, uh, overlaying a profile uh, um, over the sand. If you change the sand with your hands, the profile gets updated and the projector will update this image right now here. So he changes the real environment and um, the projector updates the profile here. So in the augmented reality, um, you extend human senses with computer generated information and you, I don't care about uh, if you have uh, a smartphone which is uh, in front of you or if you are wearing a semi-transparent display, augmented reality, glasses or something like this. So the idea is the real environment is still in the foreground but it gets enriched with computer generated uh, information. Mm -hmm. And um, um, if you have augmented virtuality, the, the virtual environment is in the foreground but you land some information out of the real environment. In this case, you can see these hands are real. Yeah? These are recorded by, for example, 3D cameras. And uh, you can grab virtual objects in the virtual environment, for example. Mm -hmm. yeah, and that's, that's um, a cool thing as well. And last but not least, virtual reality, everything is computer generated. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, that's it. Okay. And now um, we want to show a live demo um, of the TNG Augmented Rift, so our, our Terminator vision. And uh, Thomas uh, will start uh, the software in a few seconds. And let's have a nearer look onto the device. So we have um, an Oculus Rift here. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can hold the mic, sure. Mike. And then, okay, so um, we have the Oculus Rift as a base and uh, we have two web cameras here. So the web cameras are, reco oops, are recording the real environment and uh, the footage gets streamed into the Oculus Rift. So the idea was, we wanted to use off-the-shelf hardware to implement our augmented reality glasses. We, we know that this is maybe not the best solution, but we've implemented this thing one year ago and there were no uh, uh, um, really good glasses available with transparent displays where the full field of view gets augmented. So we just thought, what about using an, an Oculus Rift as a base? Mm -hmm. So we record uh, with the web cameras, we record the real environment, streaming into the Oculus Rift, and then we are using the F200 camera, we already mentioned, and uh, then we are using face detection, emotion detection, and so on, and so on. So, and uh, we can, so this is how it looks like uh, 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 <laughs> um, in an animation here. So it, it, it's, it's a real-time footage, we just recorded in our company's office, and so you can see I'm drinking uh, my beer. The Terminator's just right behind me. And then, wow, so there you can see the wireframe all over my face, the distance was measured, my emotion was uh, uh, recognized as well. And uh, so this is how it looks like. So we need, just need a few minutes, uh, seconds. Uh, Thomas is uh, still preparing um, uh, the, to start up the software. But we, or are you ready? No. no, not yet, okay. So let's move on. Um, Ah, thank you. So how it was realized, so we have a left and a right uh, a camera, it's a, it's a normal RGB camera and uh, uh, with both images we can do a stereo capture in this case. Um, the, I have to be honest, um, there are um, stereo cams out there on which you can use with only one USB. Uh, cable. In this case, we have two different cameras uh, with two USB cables. So it's, maybe it's a better solution to have this, uh, this one stereo cam. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we have a webcam processor um, 
We use OpenCV to do squint correction. What does it mean? Yeah, we have two images from two different cameras and uh, uh, to have the, a really good feeling about what you're seeing, um, you, you need to do this, this squint correction. This means um, they get somehow aligned the pictures inside the Oculus Rift mm -hmm. before they are going into the Oculus Rift. Then we have um, the real sense detector. Here we, re here we are getting or we're receiving the data like face recognition, landmark detection. Mm -hmm. yeah? And then we are using this data and we are um, merging this with our webcam data, our webcam streams. Mm -hmm. So this is the main idea. And then using the uh, 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 Oculus Rift SDK and uh, um, we were able to stream the complete picture inside the Oculus Rift. Okay, okay, Thomas, so we are now ready, so maybe we can switch over to, um, I have to do it here, okay, one moment. And now we want to show you a small live demo, okay? Everything set up? We're good. Oh, okay, so I have to, okay, let's make it loud. Um, sound is on? Okay, so now I, I'm looking into the Oculus, uh, into the augmented rift, and you can see uh, that there, in real time, um, the wireframe over my face is detected. The light conditions are not that well, maybe you can, you can try it like this, so perfect, okay. And um, when I smile, there is a emotion detection, you can see. <laughs> Oder <gasps> <gasps> and the distance is measured. And if the light condition is really good, you can uh, detect the heart rate as well. Um, I hope it's not too loud, we want to make, uh, uh, um, I want to speak with the augmented rift right now, hopefully it works. Okay, Rift. How can I help you? This is Martin. This is Martin. No. Is this really Martin? Yes. I will remember that user 100 is Martin. Oh, I'm so glad it worked. <laughs> so, and now you can see um, that uh, the Augmented Rift uh, knows my name and uh, you are able to uh, save different faces. It's, an, it's not a problem. It's, it's a shame you couldn't use Arnie's voice there. That would have been, that would have been amazing. This yeah. would be really great, but unfortunately we didn't find um, <laughs> a, a, a language pack for it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's switch back to the presentation and go on. So here we are, as a base for all of this, we use the Oculus Rift DK2. Um, the Oculus Rift contains of the display itself, which has some lenses built in, because normally you couldn't see at this distance because um, your eyes won't get attached uh, to, the near, the, to the nearer distance. And uh, then it also has a tracker built in, with which you can see the rotational, uh, the, the translational degrees of freedom. Uh, if you have a closer look at the DK2, so this is not the final version yet, uh, it is just a smartphone, basically. So th that's, this is also, also why the, there are so many uh, things like the Samsung Gear or uh, all the cardboards, uh, mm. they are all out there because everything is just a sm uh, smartphone. Um, and uh, this, uh, the Oculus Rift itself, relies on a Galaxy Note 3. It is, has even, even the touch hardware is still built in, so if you, you could touch the screen if you could reach it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here we have an uh, image uh, which, is generate, uh, which you generate to see it inside um, the Oculus Rift, so you can uh, see some kind of barrel distortion, and if you have a nearer look into the edges, you can see some kind of a chromatic aberration, you know? And um, yeah, this is done by the Oculus Rift uh, SDK. Uh, why is this the case? Yeah, it's because of the used lenses. So um, if an image goes through the lenses because they are so near to the 
Galaxy Tab, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, uh, some uh, distortion will appear and chromatic aberration will appear and so on and so on. But if you generate an image where all this is done before, it gets somehow deleted when going through the lenses. So, and this is done by the SDK. Mm -hmm. So, um, now we want to show another demo. Um, it's the um, F200 again, which we used for the Terminator vision. And um, this is a, uh, it's an HTML5 example. So you can see we can access the landmark data uh, um, as well. So no flash, no WebGL. And we get the data through a, a WebSocket in this case. And yeah, you can see it's perfectly working. Ah, um, it looks like a really old Kraftwerk video, music video. Yeah. You, you know Kraftwerk? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. We are in the robot. Dun, 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 dun. Yeah. Well, we've never oh. had anyone sing on the video before, but thank you. She is dein model <laughs> und sie sieht gut aus. <laughs> genau. Okay, so that is. Um, yeah. And now we want to show you how you can realize it. So we want to show some code now. So you can see that it is not that difficult to get the landmark data. So all we have to do is query the API in this case. So the first thing to do is you can, uh, t you can let uh, the API uh, detect the number of faces by calling the query of number, number of detected faces method. Then you can iterate over all the faces. You get the face data for each face by saying query face by index. And then you can query the landmarks. You can also query the number of points which are currently detected, and then you can copy them into a landmark array. And when you have done this query point method, all you have to do is uh, just expose and uh, try to do whatever you want to do with the landmark data. So then you have a, an array of points, and point 35, for example, is the nose. And Point 86 is uh, the left eyebrow. And, and this code would get run again and again and again. This is like event driven, right? Yeah, that's right. Uh, you can do it in an event driven way or you can do it in a synchronous way where, where you say acquire frame each time. Okay. Yeah. Um, maybe a few words uh, uh, on the code itself uh, uh, regarding um, code quality and best practices. Uh, we This is Java code. And uh, as you already recognized, um, it's maybe not the, the best uh, that the method names like query number of detected phases starts with a, uh, uh, with a capital letter. <laughs> so um, the reason on this is that uh, Intel uh, just uh, generated or used a very, very thin wrapper to its original uh, uh, language, uh, which is uh, C++ and .NET and stuff. So um, for um, the early prototypes, we've implemented um, uh, an open source library where you can use the Sense 3D camera. This was the very first gesture camera of Intel. And uh, there we are following uh, the best practices of Java code. So we have a listener, we have implemented a listener concept. The method names were, you know, best practices yeah. and so on. Yeah. yeah. What's, what's the name? Yeah, okay. okay, we already covered the heartbeat yeah. detection. A few. Yeah, okay. Okay. And so Let's, let's and now on. let's uh, see how heartbeat detection works in the API. So it's pretty much the same as it is with um, the landmark detection. So all you have to do is you just have to enable the pulse detection at first. And then you can do the same as with the landmark detection. So you query the number of detected phases, then you iterate over each phase, you get the phase data for each phase. And then you do something different, you query the pulse, and from the pulse you get the heart rate. And that's it. You ha don't have to implement the uh, low-level algorithms for yourself. Mm. You can do that if you want. So if you want to do, for example, age detection or something like this, you can write a C++ module, hook, hook that into the API, and uh, then just uh, provide your own methods for the API. But uh, you don't have to do this. Is, so it, is it easy to extend and contribute, or is it is it mostly closed? When it comes to low-level code, you have to deal with the depth map, and then you have to detect uh, things for yourself. So this is not very easy okay. then. But th this is the nature of the things. If you do OpenCV or something like this, it's not e as easy. 
mm. as well. Mm. In terms of not just the code, though, the ability to actually do it is it is it? Yeah, yeah. Are the, people the, the code is not difficult to write. Okay. But it's uh, the algorithms behind it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, let's talk about the challenges. Uh, so with our augmented reality prototype, we had lots of challenges. Mm -hmm. And the first one were the libraries in development. So you just saw this demo. This was actually done in C Sharp. We started with a Java, right? We also at the TNG booth, at the Java Land conference. We have um, also the, the Java version of it. But at some point, we had to say, OK, it doesn't work. And this was not because of Java. It was not because of uh, the, uh, the the things we were using. It was just because everything was still in development and the libraries we got were not maintained. They were not suitable for the versions we were using. And um, the only language that had actual or uh, current drivers which were working uh, yeah. really these ones. Yeah. So, so uh, the, the Oculus Rift was a development kit and the F200 camera, the 3D camera was uh, a development kit as well. So both had not that many libraries and as Thomas said, not well maintained and so on. But now, one year later, the libraries are much more stable and you can expect that with the final version of Oculus uh, uh, that there will be many more libraries on the market with which get well maintained and which will be stable. Yeah. Okay. Oops. Ah, okay. So, um, challenges, interfaces. So, uh, we exceeded the bandwidth of USB interfaces. So, um, using these uh, cameras and stuff, and uh, um, yeah, you exceed the bandwidth and uh, you have to use laptops with, uh, with many USB hosts, not, not connectors, but hosts. Yeah. Okay. And uh, of course, as I already told, uh, that uh, the weight of the augmented rift is uh, not that good. It's really weightful. And, uh, but if you maybe use something like this, it's a R200 camera, which can nearly do the same like a Kinect. Uh, you can attach it to your normal glasses with transparent displays, and then you will have a, yeah, a, a device which is uh, less weightful, you know. And this is uh, something we faced when, uh, when we had the gesture control demos. And uh, yeah, what you were always missing is haptics. So you don't feel uh, what you are doing. You cannot grab something and you, ha you don't have the haptics when you grab something, for example. And this is where Disney Research has built a prototype which sends out some yeah, uh, it it's, uh, just sends out air. Yeah. It, it compresses yeah. air and uh, then, then uh, these get sent out and you can feel, you can actually feel uh, what you are doing. So w when, uh, when you hit, a, for example, an object, it, it sends out the air and th that's about it. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, you can use gesture control in cars to control the entertainment system to navigate uh, in a map because it's much better to, to do it uh, instead of using buttons on a, on a screen or something like this. If you are driving 200 kilometers per hour, uh, it, it's not a cool thing to press some uh, uh, buttons on a touch screen, so this is more intuitive. Um, um, I, I, I think we are running out of time. Yep. So. We'll just uh, scroll through the fields of application so you can use it in traffic for non-static head-up displays, for example, like Continental. You can do it, uh, use it in the aerospace. So uh, this is a sky lens which can be used by pilots for determining the land strip. Uh, it can also be used in the industry for uh, augmented reality classes like BMW did in the year 2007, where you can be more productive by uh, pointing out what uh, the engineer has to do next. Yeah. And you can also use it in uh, medical engineering and there. Uh, augmented reality is suited as well as gesture control, for example. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's skip over there. OK, I think we are running out of time right little, now, yeah, so yeah. let's stop here. Uh, if you are interested, just uh, visit our blog, parrotsonjava.com. Um, and uh, yeah, if you like, just follow us on our Twitter channels, ask questions, whatever you want. Awesome. Well, guys, thank you very much. That was a very entertaining uh, session. Uh, this will all be available uh, on, on virtualjug.com uh, and also uh, nighthacking.com as well. So uh, thanks very much, guys, and uh, 
Yeah. Great Thank presentation. You. Cheers. Thank you. Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Okay, and...